Ladies and gentlemen, good morning to our friends in Israel and good afternoon to our audience in Hong Kong. Welcome to our Hong Kong Israel collaboration workshop on agri food tech today. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Israeli consulate and Invest Hong Kong for supporting FSDC's effort to establish a close connection between Israel's technology innovation with family offices in Hong Kong and the region. We have put together an exciting agenda for our subject matter experts to share their insights with us. Let me first introduce our moderator, Peter Golovsky, for today's forum. Peter is the Managing Director and Head of Family Office Services, Asia Pacific for Alarium and Tiedemann, a global multifamily office with responsibility for the organic and inorganic growth of the group across Hong Kong, Singapore, and Australia. Peter has over 25 years in global financial services, including the last 10 years in Hong Kong, leading family office and investment advisory businesses, working closely as a key advisor to some of Asia's largest families and family offices. In addition, Peter is the co-leader of our Hong Kong Israel collaboration workshop with Stephen Phillips, the Director General of Invest Hong Kong. I'm sure you're all eager to learn from our expert speakers. So please join me in welcoming Peter to kick off today's forum. Over to you, Peter. Well, many, th many thanks, King. But before I actually start, I just want to express my thoughts and my best wishes to those impacted uh, by the violence in Israel this week. Uh, and I just want to reflect on that for a moment. Israel has long been a pioneer in agri-food tech, uh, driven by a number of factors, including government support, living with shortages in natural resources, as we know, but importantly, fostering an incredible environment of innovation and technology disruption. As the startup nation, then the unicorn nation, and of course now the decacorn nation, Israel has a thriving agri-food tech ecosystem, now the second largest in the world with over 400 companies. On the other hand, there is an increasing focus from family offices and the next gen in particular to look for investments with purpose and impact, particularly in agri-food tech, where the convergence of ESG coupled with attractive investment returns are now creating potentially game-changing businesses. On behalf of the FSDC and together with King Ao and Stephen Phillips, I'm delighted to host and welcome you all today. Following the successful launch of our program in December last year, Today is the first of four sessions in 2022 on specific Israeli tech, taking a closer look at the vibrant agri and food tech ecosystem and the specific opportunities for investors. So a special welcome to each of you. We have over 200 joining us today uh, across China, Hong Kong, Singapore, Israel, of course, and in Europe. And I hope you enjoy today's agenda uh, and forum. To set the scene though for today's discussion, I think it's important to put some context around the agri-food tech ecosystem in Israel. And here on the slide, you can see the six main sectors of this ecosystem, starting from the top left with inputs production, importantly, alternative foods and protein. And you may recognize some of the key names here of the firms that I've listed. Supply chain preservation, yield and harvest optimization, pathogens and pests, and of course, uh, water. What's crucial to highlight is that 70% of Israel's total investment in agri-food tech in 2021 was in the alternative foods and proteins category. And again, you may recognize some of the firms that, have, that I've listed being Redefine Meat and Ala Farms. Globally though, in 2021, we saw massive investment in alternative proteins, driven by the increased concerns of food security, climate change, and particularly during the pandemic. Clearly an important topic for all of us here today 
as either consumers or investors, as we all appreciate the importance of food security, nutrition and production. Not only is Israel a global leader, but globally throughout 2021, we saw unprecedented growth in alternative proteins. And here on the slide, you can see some key headlines and some key data. And I must thank the Global and Good Food Institute in Israel for some of the data that you see here today. But some key points. Global investment in alternative proteins grew 60% in 2021 to over 5 billion. Israel is now second to the US in terms of the number of alternative protein startups, and indeed number two in the world in alternative meat, as you can see here. In 2021, over 600 million was invested in Israel across 23 deals, a 450% increase on 2020 levels. We'll look at some of these drivers of growth and explore some of these key deals shortly, but I wanted to pause for a moment. You will see Singapore on the map here, but not Hong Kong. But please watch this space as we think strategically about innovation and food tech hubs for Hong Kong and the Greater Bay Area. Delving into some of the key deals and headlines in 2021, not surprising, and you may have heard about new meat companies like Beyond Meat, Impossible Meat, Good Meat, and the list does go on. But I wanted to reflect here and look at the top five Israeli deals uh, in the last 12 months. There are two key standouts, and I want to highlight Redefine Meat and Allah Farms. And we're very fortunate today to have with us Esha ben Shitrit, CEO of Redefine Meat, and Professor Yoav Livni, who will talk more about these companies and give us and share their insights into their unique operating models, technologies, and what has made them very, very successful companies. With that, I now will invite Tamir Sarek, our Israel lead, to introduce our two keynote speakers, it's wonderful to have both Professor Yoav Livni and Professor Menachem Mashilion with us who are joining us from Israel. So with that, Shalom, Boketov, lovely to have you. And again, once again, my thoughts to those in Israel this week. So Tome, over to you. Thank you, Peter. Definitely uh, not easy times in Israel. Um, let's hear from uh, now from the, from the expert on the ground. Um, I'm happy to introduce Professor Yoav Livni. Professor Livni is a professor at the Technion University of Haifa, Israel. Uh, he's heading the lab of uh, biopolymers of food and health at the biotechnology and food engineering department. Professor Livni is an expert in uh, biopolymers delivery system for natural and uh, drugs alternative protein. Professor Livni also authored uh, over 80 publication and registered nine patents of his own uh, inventions. Um, he mentored uh, 50 masters and 10 PhD students in the area, um, and is editorial board member in several reputable journals. And as important to this group, Professor Livni uh, already commercialized his own research, uh, so he's, uh, he's, 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 uh, he's also very active in the, in the private market as well. Um, Professor Livni, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tomer and Peter. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, let me try to share the screen now. Okay. Sorry. Can you see my share? Okay. Uh, can you see my presentation now? Okay. 
So, okay, so uh, welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Professor Yoav Libni, again from the Biotechnology and Food Engineering Department at the Technion, Israel Institute of Technology. And um, I'd like to tell you about, about the exciting things that's going on in Israel right now, in Israel's food tech uh, arena. So uh, several uh, important food, food trends uh, right now in Israel. Um, first of all, alternative proteins, as was mentioned, and uh, biotech and precision fermentation, packaging, health and wellness, convenience and logistics, and of course, sustainability. Uh, so um, uh, recently, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping has referenced alternative proteins in a speech and said, it is very necessary to expand from the traditional crops and livestock and to develop uh, alternatives based on plants and microorganisms for the current for the regular uh, animal based proteins so let's see what's what's cooking in in israel's food tech uh, arena in in recent years so we have over 350 agri food startups in all stages from funding and uh, uh, different stages of development uh, the investment in, in agri-food uh, is uh, very uh, well rising, uh, very impressively rising. And interestingly, the number of rounds is decreasing, which shows that there is more um, um, mature companies with larger rounds uh, every year. Uh, for example, the future meat tech uh, developing cell-based chicken has, ra has raised $390 million uh, this year. Aleph Farms, which is based from the Technion, based on the technology by Professor Shulamit Levenberg, developing cell-based meat uh, to make steaks, uh, raised $119 million. Uh, redefined Meat, uh, uh, you'll meet Eshkhar uh, Ben Shitrit shortly. They have raised $35 million for 3D printing of plant-based meat, and so on and so forth. And there are also been very interesting partnerships, for example, Savory, with Sodesco, Future Meat with Nestle, Alpro with Strauss, and Nuva uh, with Pluristem and with Migros. Uh, several interesting product launches in 2021. Uh, for example, uh, Yo, uh, the first ever plant-based fried poached eggs, um, or Savory, which launched their first 3D printed robot chef cooked plant-based burger in Israel. We also have two uh, chickpea protein companies. One is called Chickpea and the other one is InnovoPro. And Zero Egg, which develops uh, plant-based uh, egg alternatives. Uh, we had 11 new alternative protein startups in 2021 in all three areas of, of alternative proteins, which are cultivated meat, plant-based, and fermentation. <clears throat> and uh, it's interesting to see that there is an uh, emph uh, emphasis recently on alternatives to fish like sea to cell, wanda fish, and plantish. Uh, you can see all three areas of cultivated fermentation and plant based. We have companies in seed development, pilot scale, and up to commercialization and growth. So the field is really developing very nicely. Uh, the investment in, in alternative proteins in Israel can only to the United States globally. Uh, so it's really uh, showing the <clears throat> very strong uh, place of Israel in, in leadership, in, in global leadership in the field of cultivated meat. We have several uh, food incubators in Israel. Uh, some of them or most of them are with some governmental support. The first one is the kitchen by Strauss uh, and the Israel Innovation Authority. Uh, another one is uh, the Innovation Lab by Food NXT and Fruit by Fruitaron. Uh, another one is Trendlines, which is both a VC and an incubator. Then we have Fresh Start, the Northern Food Tech Incubator, which was uh, founded by Tnuva. Tnuva by itself, as you probably know, was acquired by Bright Food several years ago from China. And uh, Fresh Start was also um, founded by Tempo, R Crowd, and Finister in 2019. And now, uh, uh, Erel Margalit, the JBP founder, is establishing the Margalit startup city up in the Galilee. It's going to be a food tech cluster 
up north in Israel. So let's see some of those uh, incubators and what they have in, in, in cooking for us. So first the kitchen. Some of the interesting companies there uh, include uh, Flying Spark, which uh, developed larvae of fruit flies as an alternative protein source. Uh, Zero Egg, I mentioned earlier, which makes omelets, scrambled eggs, and mayonnaise based on uh, plant uh, alternative to egg. Aleph Farms, uh, as I mentioned, uh, from the Technion originally, Shulamit Levenberg, and then they are developed uh, based on cultured meat. Uh, Imagine Dairy, which develops healthy, sustainable, and nutritious dairy proteins without the use of cows, based on fermentation only. It's a company I'm in, in, in collaboration with. Uh, Amai Proteins. Um, Amai Proteins uh, develop um, sweeteners based proteins, uh, and this is also a company I'm in very strong collaboration with, uh, developing alternative for sugar. Another incubator is Trendlines. They are active since 2012 with nice track record, and some of their highlights include Hargol, which is high value protein from edible grasshoppers, and also Phytolone, which develops natural colors by fermentation process. Uh, the third incubator I mentioned is Fresh Start. And as I mentioned, they, are, um, they have been established by Pnuva from Bright Food, uh, Tempo, Our Crowd, Finister, and the Israeli Innovation Authority. Uh, some of their highlights include Blue Tree, which are physical selective reduction of sugar from natural beverages, and C2 Cell, a cultured fish based on cell genetics, and, 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 uh, and several others. Now let's talk about the academic uh, uh, map of Israel in terms of alternative proteins. This map was uh, uh, prepared by the Good Food Institute, which uh, is a global uh, institute, nonprofit organization, which helps to promote uh, alternative proteins in all over the world by connecting philanthropes and, and uh, researchers. And there are many, many researchers doing, uh, working on, on alternative proteins all over in Israel. We are up here in the Technion, up in Haifa, in the northern part of Israel. And uh, this, the Technion is my, my home uh, base university. And the Technion is very active in uh, engineering and, and technology and in developing commercializable technologies, bringing them to the market. And so this, the structure on, the, on that part in the Technion, we have the research authority, which manages the research projects and the liaison with the industry. Uh, we have the tech transfer office called T3, which identifies technologies, uh, deals with patenting and commercialization, licensing of technologies, startups, and so on. And we have the Drive Accelerator, which is a nine month funding and acceleration program for pre-seed and seed companies with a focus on, on the technology and biotechnology. And finally, we have the T-Hub, which helps students and faculty develop their innovative ideas into startups. Uh, another important thing I'd like to share with you is, is called the EAT Food. It's, uh, it's the Europe's leading initiative for consumer-oriented food innovation, education, and business creation. Uh, it helps colla by collaboration, makes the food system more sustainable, healthy, and trusted. And this is actually a consortium of over 60 partners. And each partner is either a large company, a university, or a research institute. And I am personally the uh, academic coordinator of the Technion activities within this large uh, consortium. One of the most exciting activities in this consortium is the EAT Food Accelerator Network. And that is uh, an, a program which is active in six to seven locations all over Europe and at the Technion is one of them. And we help connect impactful agri-food agri startups with leading industrial and research partners to pilot their technology and by that catalyze food innovation in the agri-food sector. The first year of activity was 2018. And in that year, uh, a company, a startup company, which was mentored within this uh, fan program, uh, was called Jet Eat. And that really later became Redefined Meat. So you will meet Eshkhal when she did it later here. And he's our first graduate of that program. So we're very proud of that uh, company. 
lastly, I'll talk a little bit about my own lab and the lab of biopolymers for food and health. Um, my lab is focused on biopolymers for health uh, and for food and health applications. And I'll show you some of the pro pro uh, uh, projects we have. For example, we develop uh, encapsulation technologies technologies for health promoting compounds like astaxanthin, which gives the red color to salmon fish. So we developed a technology which helps uh, improve the bioavailability by fivefold in a human clinical study. Uh, and this was uh, funded by Futurum and the Israeli Innovation Authority. Another project which was founded, funded by the EAT Food and that is in collaboration with the MyProteins I mentioned and also with PepsiCo and Danone. And here we develop microencapsulated sweet proteins as sugar substitutes. This project won the first prize in the EAT Food Innovation Impact Awards last year. Uh, lastly, we have a, a project funded by the Good Food Institute and that is to extract proteins and starch from macroalgae uh, seeds and develop them into food of food or proteins alternatives like seafood alternatives and so on. The last thing I'd like to tell you is a, is a small uh, company, a startup company rise, uh, developed on a, based on my technology and that is called Prebio for your microbiome. And Prebio is the world's first and only protein-based prebiotic for my, your microbiota. And we have uh, developed a technology which is inspired by selective targeted delivery of uh, drugs of anti-cancer drug, and we bring those proteins directly to the probiotic bacteria, and we manage to fivefold increase the relative abundance of a very important uh, probiotic bacterium, which is known to decrease obesity and metabolic diseases. This is my team. It was a pleasure, and be glad to answer later your questions. Thank you very much. Tamir, over to you to invite to Menachem, please. Um, thank you. I'm just trying to turn my camera on. Um, that's all right. Um, thank you, Professor Livni. Very interesting presentation indeed. Um, now, um, I'd like to move to, um, to the Agritech part of, uh, of the keynote speech. Um, I will now introduce Professor uh, Menachem Moshe Leon. Professor Moshe Leon is a professor of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Israel, of course, and his research area is especially in interesting these days of climate change. Professor Moshe Leon, a molecular physiologist, physiologist uh, focused on whole plant water use efficiency and crop productivity under normal and more interesting under abiotic stress conditions. Uh, Professor Moshe Leon is an expert in high thr uh, throughput func uh, functional phenotyping of a uh, whole plant water re uh, relation and, and resp uh, responses to environmental stress, uh, which he commercialized already as a, as a co-founder of the company Plant Detect. Um, and I'm sure uh, Professor Moshe Leon will tell you a bit more about that. Uh, Professor Moshe Leon, please, uh, I'm very excited to hear your presentation. Thank you, Tomer, uh, and also Peter for inviting me. Uh, as Tomer said, I'm coming from the other part of the food chain from the production. And when I say production, I mean, I mean uh, production of the, all the organic matter. As you know, plants are the fundamental organization that actually produce all the amino acids, fatty acids, uh, um, sugars, and, and, uh, and, and so on that we need because plants are the only organism on earth that can take inorganic substance like water and CO2 and make uh, organic substance and you know the rest is just the food chain so the the problem we have today and i think we all know it that we have to produce much more food so we are talking about 9 billion people in 30 years and to feed this amount of people we need to increase the food productivity which means more crop growing more crop by 70 percent this is a huge number because of the risk you can see here, the main risk is water. 
And what do, I, what do I mean by that? So to produce food, you need a lot of water. Plants take a lot of water, for example, to produce one banana, the farmer have to irrigate the crops one, uh, 100 liter per one banana. Think about it, one banana is 100 liter because by the time, from the, from the time you see the plant until the time you get the banana, you have to irrigate every day the plant. And if you sum up the numbers, you get huge amount of numbers. By the way, avocado is even more. And, and this is our main problem. Why? Because we are facing gro uh, global warming. When we talk today about drought year, like this year at 2008, this was taken from Bayer Crop Sciences. It's a big uh, um, breeding company. The orange color here you see is the losses for the major crops because of drought. Some crop reach 80% loss because of drought. Think about that in the coming years, you're going to have more and more year like this. So there is a big, big problem with drought and crops. So the main solution today is to breed, breed better crops that could stand drought. The problem is this time period takes, you see? It takes like uh, 20 to 25 years, 20 to 25 years to develop a new crop that are uh, resistant to drought. Why is it? Because the environment is very fluctuating. Every year you do experiment in the field, you can get different conditions. So it's very hard to work consistently uh, because you need to breed something that needs to grow in the field and field is not a lab. Field is a very problematic area to work with, especially when you want to do good science and you want to do breeding. So it's take a lot of time. Another big problem we have is the fact that although we have a lot of genotypes, what do I mean by that? We have thousands, literally, for example, if I want to improve wheat, like you see in this picture, and I want to make it drought resistant. I have literally thousands and thousands of seed bags with different wheats from all over the world. How can I choose the right wheat? It's a big issue. We don't know which of them is going to be the drought resistant. Although we have the genome today to get a genome of, of a plant, it's relatively cheap. In $2,000, you can get a genome. But the fact I have the genome, I have 100% of my genome. That means I know the sequence, I know the code. It doesn't mean I know how this code is going to translate to phenom. Phenom is how the plant looks and how it's behaving in the field. We, we can hardly know by the genome how the phenom is going to it's produce because the genome is just a list of genes. We don't know how they're going to interact and especially under stress, under heat or drought stress, we don't know how the phenom is going to, uh, to react and we don't know which plant is going to, to be better in the field. This is why in the Hebrew University, I forgot to mention I'm coming from the Hebrew University, the Faculty of Agriculture. Uh, I've been here in the last uh, 15 years. And here we develop a system called plant, a company called Plant Ditech. And basically what this company does, it's providing sensors like this Apple Watch you see here that measure continuously the physiological parameters of a human being. We develop a sensors that do the same, this measurement of physiological parameter, only do it to the plant. So what we do, we have this platform that's called Plant Array that control each and every one of the plants, give it any irrigation or fertilization you want, but at the same time, take a lot of measurement, a lot of physiological measurement. This enable us first to control the irrigation of each plant separately. You see, we can give each plant a different treatment, but to do the treatment continuously and simultaneously to all the plants in the experiment. And we can measure many, many, many physiological parameters or are very important to characterize the plant response to drought. So when we do this, we can actually get a very good profile of the plant and to send to the field where I tell you the field is a very problematic place. We only send the plant that have much better uh, um, successful rate. We have, of course, a lot of software and, uh, and way to analyze the big data we get. So I'm not going to get into this, but in, the important thing to remember, we get absolutely measurement, absolutely value measurement of key physiological traits like whole plant biomass gain, transpiration. This is the amount of water the plant lose. As I told you, plant lose a lot of water by the growth rate. And if we can measure this, we can see 
which plant transpire less so we can see who is the wa more water saving plant. This is one example you can see here a chickpea field, digital pea of chickpea. All the plant you see here in the middle, in the side, are chickpea. And we screen chickpea all over the world. Uh, sorry, chickpea coming from all over the world uh, in order to find the plant which will be the most drought tolerant. Why do we study chickpea? Because chickpea is one of the best uh, uh, plants with a very good source to protein that naturally develop in the Middle East. So we think that we can find good genomes that coming from the Middle East, Israel, Syria, Jordan, Turkey, Lebanon, there are many chickpeas in this area. I'm, I'm talking about wild types that may uh, uh, give us a drought resistant genes. So we screen them on our system in order to breed them in the future to much uh, better crops in the field. Uh, the company we developed was actually starting as an idea in the Hebrew University. So somewhere around 2007, we, we came with the idea that we can maybe uh, develop this system. The first idea uh, was established together with Evogen. It's another uh, ag tech company in Israel. And we saw that our system and algorithm uh, gave Evogen a big advantage so they can screen very faster plant. We came with this idea to Yisum. Yisum is the technology transfer company of the Hebrew University. Every university in Israel has this technology transfer company that actually write patent for the university. University is non-profit organization. And in order to write patent, the university has to have some kind of a companion company that work under the university, but it's not really legally not part of the university that can transfer the, the ideas to patent. And this is exactly what we did. And this enabled us to go to the market in 2017, raise money and establish Plant Tech that to, today sell all over the world, including China. I, I gather a few Chinese universities that already bought the system. In, in some of them, I also collaborate. All of these uh, universities today start also to work with our system, including supplier in China that sell the system. So today, uh, our company sell all over the world and, and keep growing because of the need of this fast breeding tool that can really predict the plants. Now, this tool is purely for research, but the next step that Plant I Tech want to go to, it's want to go to the farmers, to the, to the growing farmers. Remember, I told you that today we are, we are facing global warming and we don't want to get to these problems. So we want to irrigate. Now, there are many irrigation companies. You saw this picture previous at Peter presentation, but all of these are irrigation companies in Israel that work either on soil, plant, or atmosphere measurement. These measurements are very nice, but they give you absolute value. So you can either measure the plant or the soil or the atmosphere. I'm not going to get into details. Uh, all of these uh, uh, companies give you uh, some close estimation because none of them can really measure the absolute number. What do I mean by that? All of these sensors and probe measure part of the plant or the soil or the atmosphere. But when you really want to know how much ML do I need to give to my plant, you have to estimate. It's a good estimation, but in the summer, it can get like 30% mistake. It's like you're driving your car and instead of getting the mile per hour or kilometer per hour, you get a relative value of speed. This is the problem with the sensors. So Plant I Tech now want to go to the irrigation uh, global market, which is a huge market. Uh, I'm not going to get too much to details because actually I'm not coming from this uh, economic field, but there is a huge market to, for irrigation. And because of Plant I Tech, absolute values and algorithm that actually give you accuracy in the ML level, uh, this is now where we want to go to raise money and to, to um, put plant I tech into the commercial, uh, or I would say farmer uh, market and not just the scientific market. Thank you. I just want to uh, acknowledge the um, fund I got to do my research. It was DFG from Germany, the Israeli Ministry of Science uh, and the Ministry of Agriculture. And thank you for attention.
Well, thank you very much, Menachem and Yoav, uh, and delighted now to introduce uh, the panel discussion <clears throat> for today. And firstly, let me introduce uh, two of our distinguished uh, panelists that you have not met. Firstly, Esha Ben Sidrit. Uh, Esha is the CEO of Redefined Meat. Uh, we were chatting the other day and he describes himself uh, as a technology strategist by day and a passionate foodie uh, and chef by night. Uh, I can see why after practicing law uh, in the Supreme Court of Israel, I can see that you would have pivoted to high tech. Uh, uh, Esha had roles at HP Indigo and Hycon Systems where he developed and launched various digital products. In 2018, he began and pursued his dream to create advanced technologies to solve problems within the food supply chain and to transform the way meat is produced. Uh, with this vision, uh, Esha founded Redefine Meat, harnessing advanced technologies and, and not animals to create premium and delicious meat. Today, the company leads the new meat industry revolution, providing global consumers with entirely animal-free meat, whilst delivering the perfect, as he described, sensory experience. Esha, delighted for you to be with us today. Thank you, Peter, Secondly, to be here, and thanks for the great intro. Uh, <laughs> Secondly, um, someone who actually needs no introduction, but he's going to get one in any case, is my very, very good friend, Eric Ning, uh, a leading key VC investor in Israel uh, for a long time. Eric, as many of you know, is the CEO of Happiness Capital, which is part of the Lee Kum Kee Group in Hong Kong. Founded in 1888, I learnt, uh, and as you know, uh, the makers of the very famous oyster sauce. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Happiness Capital is a leading early stage VC investor with a number of investments globally, and particularly in Israel, across key sectors, including agri food tech and health and wellness. Eric also sits on the Hong Kong Israel Collaboration Advisory Board. As always, Eric, absolutely delighted uh, for you to be with us uh, today. And of course, many thanks uh, to you, Ava Menachem, as well. For the first question, uh, Eric, if I may, uh, I might start with, with you. Um, as I mentioned, you were no stranger to investing uh, in Israel with 14 direct investments in Israel, including Redefined Meat. And most of your activity and focus has been in the alternative protein space. Perhaps you can share with us, what is it about Redefine meat that has led to happiness's involvement. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Peter. Um, first of all, uh, Esha and his team are very mission driven. Uh, they aim to produce a high quality new meat that provides the same meat eating experience to people without further damaging our planet. Uh, so, when founders and teams are very mission driven, they're very passionate and they're very persistent in making the company a great success. So we, uh, we think the team can actually great, you know, do some great work and they would like to become the, maybe the, the, the largest and most innovative food company uh, in the world. And the team is super capable and they have uh, you know, diverse backgrounds that cover a lot of areas that we define meet uh, needs such as uh, 3D printing, food science, chemistry, business development, and even culinary as they have uh, wonderful chefs working in-house too and they, uh, they have like all these tasting events almost every day, hosting people, get feedback. And, and sometimes when I look pictures and videos, I really want to just jump into the iPad and eat it as well <laughs> uh, together with them. Um, and from the technology perspective, uh, Redefine is a platform, not just a, a meat product company, which is quite important uh, to investors. Uh, the 3D printing platform can print any kind of meat. Uh, they currently use uh, plant-based ingredients to print meat. But uh, in the future, they may expand to other ingredients, other non-animal sources, such as uh, precision fermentation-based uh, ingredients. Uh, and for the mill, um, we define we owns the entire stack of meat production. They cover end-to-end -end production from raw materials to uh, end products. Uh, therefore, they, uh, they're able to manage the quality and the supply chain much better than other companies that rely part of their production on third parties. Uh, and from the product perspective, um, it's really wonderful product, tasty, and uh, the flavor, texture, smell, and appearance are extremely important in meat. Uh, and Redefine Meat actually crack all that, and they provide all these experience to their customers, and even the world's first perfect 
whole muscle cut experience that you can actually cut as a steak that can fool meat lovers. Um, and uh, I would like encourage you to uh, join their tasting events in uh, different parts of the world when it comes to your country and, uh, and you can really like, you know, taste the difference. Yeah, back to you, Peter. No, uh, thank, thanks, Eric. And look, the next one is for Esha. You know, absolutely delighted to have you with us today as the CEO of Redefine, you know, really leading uh, the revolution. Perhaps for those listening, uh, as we have today from China, across the Greater Bay Area, Hong Kong, and indeed in Singapore, perhaps you can share with us what is unique uh, about the technology and how you see the company growing globally, but particularly here in Asia. Uh, definitely, Peter and Eric, thank you for the great description. I couldn't put it better myself. And it's very exciting to see that you have the same passion in a, such a far place of the world to what we're doing every day. Uh, Eric, Eric noted something that I think is dramatic for technology, Peter. The, the mission that we have is so tremendous, so complex, so terrifying even, that we need to believe uh, in it dramatically. And we need to understand that what we're doing is complicated and challenging and will take a lot of time. And in order to deal with those challenges, you need to really go deep into the technology. You cannot expect to create tasty steaks not coming from animals without seriously investing in technology, but you need to have also a philosophy behind this technology. And we started with an intuition uh, that Eric noted uh, to it a little bit, that you cannot create a product, that a technology that creates a product is the wrong approach because look at a cow, a cow is a technology and the cow knows how to produce many, many different products. And by trying to understand what is it in a cow or pork or uh, other types of animals that creates such an amazing food product that is so different, it's different inside the same animal, it's different within different breeds or, or even different uh, continents. If you try to understand that, you can have a chance to replace the animal. And, and we started really developing, researching and developing the individual components in the muscle structure of meat, especially beef, which we call muscle, fat and blood. Those are the main ones. We have teams working separately on muscle, fat and blood. Another one is actually connective tissue. And once we understood what is each one's function across hundreds of parameters, chemical properties, physical property, thermal behavior, et cetera, et cetera, we started to look in nature, mostly in the plant uh, kingdom, for ingredients that have the potential to deliver the same function. So with muscle, you need proteins. This was, was given from day one. So researching hundreds of types of proteins, processes, until we developed a formulation that we call muscle. The same we did for fat. We researched until we found the right composition of plant-based fats uh, and oils that can deliver functions, specific functions. And the same for blood. Once we had that, in the beginning, we tasted separately the muscle, the fat and blood. Once we had that, we looked on the matrix, on the structure. And indeed, as, as both of you mentioned, uh, we, we believe, uh, and we are demonstrating it quite nicely now in restaurants in Israel, London, Amsterdam, and Berlin, that for a steak, for whole muscle, you need a new approach, a new technology. Uh, we call it additive manufacturing. Most people call it 3D printing but only by producing a food product layer by layer, uh, dot by dot, point by point, you can recreate the matrix that delivers the experience. And our technology is Meat Matrix, Meat Matrix additive manufacturing. Uh, we are the first company to, to work on this uh, idea, the first company to patent this idea. Uh, and fortunately for us, uh, faster than we expected, the first company to launch in the market at, at a good scale, uh, additive manufacturing, additive manufacturing, whole muscle cuts of meat, uh, the flank steaks that we have now in Israel. And, and ever since we did that, it's, it's a game changing moment for the company because there is almost no restaurant um, that is not open to us now, uh, especially the ones that love meat, especially the chefs that love meat, but also consumers that are not necessarily the vegans and vegetarians. And that's based only uh, uh, by the technology. And we're just getting started. We still have a lot of room to improve and work on our technology. 
Well, I know we have a number of people uh, on this call uh, in the restaurant industry across Asia, and I'm eagerly looking forward to seeing it uh, here in Asia soon. But the next question actually is to both you uh, and Eric, uh, in terms of some of the comments we all made earlier. 2021, of course, saw a huge investment globally in alternative proteins in excess of 5 billion. So to, to each of you, uh, and Eric, I might start with you, what, what's next? What, what, what are some of the trends uh, now uh, as we sort of move through the next few years and what should investors uh, be looking for? Okay, um, at uh, Happiness Capital, we continue to support the production of food in sustainable ways uh, that can save our planet from further damages. Uh, we have been investing in different kinds of uh, alternative protein production, such as uh, the conversion of carbon dioxide into food, dairy without cows, uh, cell culture seafood, insect protein, and even pr produced by molecular, molecular farming, such as the production of myoglobin from chloroplasts in plants. Um, and all these new foods are produced uh, uh, using more sustainable methods. And these food products could be more healthy as well. And for example, Esha just uh, mentioned about the plant-based fat or plant-based oil that can still give you the same taste and flavor and texture in, um, in the new food. And we can even enable people who could not have enjoyed certain food to, to start enjoying again, such as the lactose intolerant people who could not have enjoyed dairy products before they will start enjoying ice cream and cheese in the future. And Happiness Capital is also expanding our investment focus to enable these alternative protein, uh, protein companies to scale up faster, which is very important. You know, to, for, for them to become real food to, real, to all of us, uh, we need to help them to scale faster. So we have invested in companies that can help uh, new food companies to speed up the production in much larger volumes at much lower cost. Um, so um, those are the, uh, the trends that, that we're catching and uh, that we're trying to uh, create a new future for food um, lovers uh, that can save the planet and also at the same time uh, improve their health. Yes, sir. before we ask uh, Tamir to invite Menachem and Yuav uh, to, to some of the Q&A, uh, did you want to pass a comment or view on what's next uh, from your perspective? Definitely, and referring to what Eric mentioned, in the past decade, uh, seen a lot of investment in technology, uh, which allowed a lot of technologies to come to maturity or, or close to that. And now, uh, in the coming few years, you will see companies emerging that are not only uh, working on technology in a lab, but producing and expanding globally, building a resilient and sustainable supply chain, which is very much needed, even when you have great technology and uh, recognize brands that invite more consumers to join this, this revolution. Uh, and the only way to achieve the impact that we want to achieve through our work is by becoming a global uh, brand. And with that, Peter, uh, there is no question that today the biggest market, the existing market is in the USA. But if you look at the next five years where companies will grow and more products will be in the market, Asia uh, will become the most important uh, market. Uh, because of its size, because of the potential, and because of the urgent need to have solutions in large markets today uh, to fight the climate crisis that we are all facing and, and to deliver the value that we can deliver in products like ours and the ecosystem that we are building. Uh, and we are all in Israel very proud that this ecosystem is starting in Israel and looking forward to bring it together as an ecosystem to Asia and Hong Kong as well. So, Mayor, uh, over to you to, uh, to ask uh, some of the questions. But before, before I do, um, the chat box is there for everybody. I do see some excellent questions coming through for the panelists. So please uh, keep those coming in. To Mayor, over, over to you. Uh, and then I'll uh, come back uh, to everyone in a moment. Um, thank you, Peter and uh, Eric and Ashkar for, the, for, for your, for your interesting uh, insights. Um, I have a few questions for uh, Professor Livni and Professor Moshe Leon. I'll, I'll start with uh, Professor Livni. I've got uh, three questions uh, to you, if you don't mind. Um, you talked uh, earlier about the ecosystem of food tech with the Technion University in Israel. Uh, we talked about two incubators and a research center you are, you are in the process of building. Um, could you please let us know more about, about it and, uh, and how the audience here could get involved if they wish? Sure. Uh, so indeed, uh, Technion is really the leading technological university in Israel, and my department is actually the only food engineering department in Israel. 
And recently, the Technion opened branches both in Manhattan and in Guangdong, where uh, my department has actually established a daughter in the Department of Biotechnology and Food Engineering. Uh, as I mentioned, the Technion Research and Development <coughs> Foundation for the drive incubator, which uh, we would, uh, would greatly benefit from uh, investment in its startup. So that would be a good way to get involved and to, to um, participate. Uh, for getting involved in that, you may contact Dr. Uh, Shuli Schwartz, from, who is the drive, man drive managing, or contact the Technion Vice President of Research, uh, Professor Kobe uh, Rubinstein. Uh, indeed, as you mentioned, we are in initial stages of establishing an alternative protein research center at the Technion. Uh, however, this research would uh, attract philanthropic funding uh, for basic and applied research, from which next uh, the, the next commercializable, commercializable technologies uh, would arise. So that is uh, still in the making. Thank you. Um, my second question to you is, um... Could you please tell us more about the company you set up, the commercialization of your research? Uh, sure. Um, uh, is it possible to, to uh, share slides again? Um, or just... Good. Okay, so um, so the company is uh, is called FreeBio, as I mentioned. Uh, it's uh, actually for your microbiome. Uh, in in our gut, there is a shortage of uh, protein because all of the most of the protein that we uh, consume is being uh, digested and absorbed by us, uh, and so. Uh, the 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 good micro the good bacteria in our gut they need the protein too and all of the existing uh, prebiotic compounds in the market which are compounds that are intended to promote or to nourish the the good bacteria they are all carbohydrate based so we are actually uh, introducing a new uh, uh, idea of uh, a protein based prebiotic uh, compound and that is free bio and um, so you want that to be a food additive uh, and uh, also a uh, dietary supplement and we have ip on that and uh, and uh, we are developing this uh, technology further the idea is basically to take a protein pre-digest it so it will be less digestible later on conjugate it to prebiotic oligosaccharides and then uh, deliver it to the to the colon uh, where it would selectively be taken up by the good bacteria and not by others. And so we managed to get a proof of concept in vivo, in the in vivo study, where we identify that our conjugates selectively uh, um, manage to um, uh, enrich a very unique and important probiotic bacterium, which is uh, by our conjugates uh, was enriched by fivefold. And now this uh, company uh, already has, uh, we saw, as I mentioned, we have the patents and we have several peer reviewed publications and we have the proof of concept. And now we are established itself to develop the technology and bring it to the market. Uh, our team includes uh, uh, Adi Seifert, who used to be my student. Uh, and she's a co founder, and, and uh, Shaul Kodel, who is uh, also a co founder and CEO. Uh, in the team, also, Stav Pellet from my lab, a PhD student, working on this technology. And this is being developed in collaboration with Professor Yecheskel Kashi uh, from our department and his student, Shai Freilich, and also Dr. Avita Delman, my lab manager. And so, uh, this uh, we are now. Uh, starting to raise the first round of $2 million uh, for 24 months to further develop the prototype, do the clinical studies, and bring it uh, closer to commercialization. Uh, some contact information of Shaul and Adi, and uh, that's, that's uh, about our, our company. Um, thank you, Professor Livni. Um, just one more question that uh, 
um, it really came up um, now when you are just answering my, my, my first question and previously in your conversation. Um, you mentioned a few times about um, the, the relationship and the links uh, you have to, uh, to China already and the, and the extensive work you do with it. Uh, could, you, could you elaborate a bit more about, um, about the already uh, operational relationship with China? Uh, sure. So as I mentioned, the Technion uh, um, has established uh, a branch, if you like, uh, in, in Guangdong. And this is actually a, a young university with several new departments. And uh, one of the departments is, is like a daughter or a sister department in biotechnology and food engineering, where my department has actually helped recruiting their faculty members and teach their students and uh, keep mentoring them until they become completely uh, an independent independent department. So uh, that's been the main the major uh, uh, track of our uh, collaboration with uh, with China recently. Uh, but uh, there are also various uh, uh, collaborations in, in funding and projects. But that is too specific. Nothing I can really elaborate on right now. But uh, definitely, the China is an exciting. Uh, uh, like new frontier for us, we, we want to get more and more involved in, in research and in, 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 in uh, developing of uh, ventures and uh, startups. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions uh, to uh, Professor Michelle now, if you, if you, if, if you don't mind. Um, for the investors in this forum, which areas of agri-tech do you see as promising for the future? them to look at and monitor you mean from the agricultural point of view yeah for sure, for sure. yeah so uh, obviously the plant environment interaction is one of the main problems today today i can say we are also on the limit of the food production in the world see what happened now in ukraine you know one country or two countries are in fights and in a minute all the price of food is raising up it means that our source of food are very limited today. And think about drought in Ukraine next year. I, I, I hope not, yes, but think about the problematic issue we have today. It's a very gentle um, environment where few countries produce the food to all of the world. Um, not to mention huge countries like China and, 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 and United States and so on. For example, Israel, uh, import 90% of its seeds. 90% of the seeds of Israel are imported. Now, most of the seeds are used to feed cattle and chicken and fish. But even so, these are the seed we buy are actually our protein because we feed, you know, we feed the animals and then we eat them. So uh, the main problem, it's not just the population is growing. It's also that we have less land and the land we stay with, you know, people are growing, you need bigger cities and so on. So the quality of the water is deteriorated and so on. So from my point of view, this is one of the things to investigate in, how to improve our food supply chain, how to, imp to improve our crops that will be much more resistant to, to the heat and drought that we expected this for sure will come. And to prevent this crisis of, uh, you know, any point in the chain of, of production and, and you have an immediate increase of prices. Thank you. Um, one more question to you, please. Um, you, you, you briefly talked about uh, the plant uh, Ditech, uh, the company you set up and commercialized your research. Could you elaborate a bit more about it, please? Oh yeah, gladly. Um, maybe I will share my screen just to explain more. So the company, um, so do you see the screen? I don't Yes. Sorry. So uh, the company was established uh, in the Hebrew University. So the actual establishment was at 2017 uh, when it raised enough money to be independent. And from this point, it's, it's uh, independent. The company itself, uh, let me, this is the website of the company. It's Israeli company located at Yavne, Israel. And the company actually uh, build and sell screening system. The main product is actually the algorithm. 
So the company actually uh, built platform that you can screen literally hundreds of plants, as you can see here in the picture. Each plant can get its own treatment. So for example, if you want to do simulation of drought in Germany, you can put whatever soil you want in the pot and put whatever nutrient and irrigation and everything is controlled by computer. And then you measure many physiological parameters. It's very important to measure physiological parameters because the plant production, right? To make uh, carbohydrates, you need photosynthesis, right? To make proteins, you need photosynthesis plus nitrogen from the soil. The plant take sugar, it take nitrogen for this, from the soil, inorganic. And when you put the nitrogen to the sugar, you get protein, basically. You get amino acids. Amino acid is protein plus carbon. So we can actually create all kind of irrigation with nutrient and, and, and drought and salinity. And the company basically also not just give the treatment, but also measure it. Think about this runner on this machine. You can set up the stress, you know, by making it run faster or in a deeper slope. But, and while the runner is running, you can me measure its heartbeat. So plant I take do the same for plants. You can stress each plant and get its physiological profile online simultaneously all the data is directly going online and you get all the data so you get the crude data plant tech not only produce the the hardware it also produced the software that you can do online uh, analysis so you can really take all the data and get statistical analysis and to choose your plant very fast remember the main problem here is time to market you want to screen your plant as fast as possible and if normal screening uh, take a year, plant I take reduce it to three months. So these are the, the, the main thing the company does. Uh, I show you here a collaboration we have with China on, on, on uh, chickpea, because these again, these are protein plants. Ch uh, chickpea produce a very high profile protein. It's one of the protein plants. There is also cowpea and, and soya, it's much more famous. Uh, but we, took, we, we choose chickpea because of its uh, relative more drought resistance. Thank you. Um, and just one more, one more last question. Um, again, we talked before about about the some work you already do um, with China. Could you could you elaborate on that, please, just a little bit? Oh yeah, gladly. So, my main collaboration is Professor uh, uh, Pei Xu. Just a minute, maybe I show you his name. Yeah. So, Professor Pei Xu from China. Uh, Jianglin University is a cowpea expert. Cowpea is a very important legume. Legume is a, is a protein plant from China. He's a geneticist. And in his research, he tried to find the gene that's responsible to the physiological profile we measure. So actually, you also have this machine, the plantary machine, and he screens literally thousands of cowpea plants and finding the best performance, and then try to understand what is the mechanism for this better performance in order to have a faster breeding. For example, if he found cowpea genetically with better genes, he would try to take these genes and to integrate them into other cowpeas or chickpeas or soya, other protein plants. So this is a very fine collaboration already yielded several papers, several grants. We work together for, I think, more than 10 years. Many thanks, Thank you, Menachem. Uh, and um, uh, we have a few questions for Esha uh, and uh, Eric uh, from, from the audience. I think the first one here is uh, for Esha, if I may. Uh, thank you uh, to, to Leila. Uh, what are the limitations in mass producing or scaling production uh, of redefined meat? Maybe you could comment on that, uh, Esha. It's a great question because it's it's very hard to, to give a simple answer. The biggest challenge that we see today in the industry and in redefining meat is to decide in what to scale because anything can be scaled, especially in plant-based. Uh, the challenges of supply chain, sourcing ingredients are not different than another food product, uh, but meat is such a diverse uh, field of, of uh, products, cultures, traditions, uh, and we want to maintain the respect to, to its very specific place in different cultures. And we want to really have a good product that matches the needs of most of consumers around the world. 
So we are scaling up products now, but let's say that the, the products are designed for the European market. Should we scale those products now dramatically fast in Asia? I'm not sure at all. Uh, so we're embedded in the scale up processes, much more iterations and much more systems and even technologies to rapidly test and change. And today, if we would stay with the same product and scale them, it's, it's challenging. Additive manufacturing is slower than normal production, but it's something that is dramatically uh, has the potential to scale. But companies in this space need to know what to scale, need to be very clear about the value proposition and the functional element uh, with consumers before they scale. And when they have that, scale as fast as possible. But for us, even with, with our stakes that have amazing uh, reception in the, in the Israel market and in Europe, we have hundreds of items we want to improve, and we rather improve those before we run to scale fast. I think that the three or four years from now, the supply chain or plant-based protein, plant-based fat, will need to adopt, especially because of the limitation of, of space, water, uh, and the need to grow crops for other industries, as Professor Moshilion uh, mentioned, we, we will need to build a more resilient supply chain that will ensure not only we have enough ingredients, but also that those are grown sustainably because we have a potential to, to replace a, a very, very challenging uh, industry from an environmental perspective, but we need to do it in a way that will not create another uh, problem. And, and as Professor Moshigan mentioned, some crops, even that are plants, require a lot of uh, water and uh, have has an impact on the environment. And it's our job to look ahead and to scale in the right way uh, for, for future generations. Thanks, Esher. I think, uh, Eric, you're probably best placed uh, to, to answer the next question. Uh, one from uh, one of our guests. What unique features do you see that Hong Kong, I think more broadly, can contribute uh, to the agri-tech movement? Uh, you're probably best placed to, to give us a perspective uh, from Hong Kong. Right. Um, well, first of all, of course, Hong Kong investors like us can uh, go out <laughs> globally to uh, find the best uh, food companies uh, to, uh, to invest in and, and then um, bring them to Asia. Um, so uh, for, like no Israeli companies can come to Hong Kong, even the Greater Bay Area to set up the research and uh, production base uh, to serve both the China and Asia markets. Um, and of course, the China the Hong Kong government and the local governments in GBA are very supportive uh, in, in many um, um, fronts, uh, like uh, funding, policy, space, expertise, partnering you up with uh, manufacturers. And, uh, and in the near future, um, food processing companies uh, may be able to sell their food products directly to mainland China if the production base is in a greater Bay area, including Hong Kong. So that means that you don't need to go through the hassles of uh, applying for import license to, uh, to start selling the meat product or, or food products into China, uh, which is a, a unique um, advantage if um, a company has a, a base in, in the Greater Bay Area. Um, and, and also, as everyone knows, uh, Asia is a very fragmented market. Um, and uh, a lot of companies, uh, not only from Israel, but like from Europe and, and the US, they also want to explore the China Asian market. Um, but um, but the, uh, the complexity in the market and the fragmentation actually uh, make a lot of companies um, um, uh, uh, feel that it's quite challenging to uh, to deal with all the different culture. In particular, food is uh, is not a, like one one food fits all because <laughs> yeah, every different Asian country has different um, um, favorable foods and and also food uh, packaged food products. So. Um, so Hong Kong is a, is a, is a, like a hub and, and also Hong Kong is well known as a heaven for the best food. So, uh, so we can actually work with a lot of you know, food companies like Le Kong Ki uh, and other food companies based in the area um, to develop um, some um, customized food products for the market so that you can actually uh, go hand in hand with these uh, um, uh, big players in the, in the market to, um, to, um, to penetrate and, uh, and which is, uh, I think would be one of the um, the trends in the, the near future um, for for these uh, foreign food companies to work uh, hand in hand with local guys to develop some tasty uh, local food products. Thanks, Eric. And before I have a, a, a final question or two for each of the panelists, actually, I have one more question for Esha. Uh, when I read about redefine meat and I guess the targets that you've set uh, on ESG in terms of 
CO2 emissions being saved, kilograms of feed saved, and litres of water saved. I mean, I think you really do lead the way in terms of metrics. Maybe you can just share with us um, uh, the targets that you've set and, and where the uh, uh, focus is from an impact uh, and social perspective. It's not, it's not a secret that our ambition is to become the world's largest meat company. And we believe that by doing that, we can have an impact on the environment, people's life, and of course, create a great business. If you look today at the meat industry, uh, there's a lot of ways to, to try to understand and fathom the impact on, on the planet. But it's enough to say that there are 1 billion cows uh, that are grown today around the world, and they consume more water and more food than the entire humanity. So we are not able to replace 1 billion cows. It's not going to happen in the next five years, but in the next 10 years, we want to be in the equivalent of a big meat company. So big meat companies produce meat annually at about 20 billion tons. And, and that is uh, in terms of, of impact on the environment, it's like a, a country that stops using cars uh, or, or an entire population that doesn't drink water for a year. And the key is the focus on beef. Uh, because beef is such uh, an inefficient machine to create food with such high level of emissions. Uh, and, and Peter, what you mentioned is, is very important. We measure it in a serious way, uh, and we try to see how our entire process, what is called a life cycle analysis of the entire process, uh, stands against meat. And when you look actually on beef, it's very easy. When you look at chicken, it's a little bit more difficult because coffee uh, pollutes more than um, than chicken, for example. This is our, our obsession with beef, our obsession with this mammal. And, and indeed, if we can uh, have a dent in the beef industry in the coming decade, I think it will have a dramatic effect on, on how the planet looks like and what is the outlook uh, of, of a sustainable industry. But it will also give some hope to others. And we want to give hope to those working on, on technologies for the agriculture world, technology for fish replacement, uh, technology for dairy alternatives that Eric mentioned, because we cannot do it alone. Uh, but, but how incredible it is that there is a potential industry that is good for investors and good for the planet, and it all comes down to great tasty food. Uh, so so it's, it's a, as I started, a scary mission, but we have a lot of drive and a lot of belief that, that it will happen, but it also has to happen, and it's our job to make it reality. And so, look, as we uh, think about closing the forum soon, and uh, I have one final question I'd like to ask each of the, the panellists uh, for their view on. Um, it's if, uh, but also when. When would we expect to see alternative foods totally replace animal food? So I guess there's two parts to this. Will we? And if we do, when would we expect to see alternative foods totally replace uh, animal foods? I think that's a really interesting question. Thank you, Irene, for sharing that with us. Um, uh, Eric, uh, would you like to lead off? Uh, uh, and then I'd like to hear from everyone uh, with their views. Um, I don't really think uh, we will completely replace um, the, um, the uh, existing foods, but we might actually have um, more variety and, and more um, sustainable version of the, uh, the existing foods, or even like something completely new <laughs> that we haven't eaten before and we will see them in, in the near future. Um, and, uh, and even if uh, a piece of meat could be also, the real meat could, could still be produced in a more sustainable and in very different way than today's. So, um, and I think uh, the diversity or uh, variety of food would be quite important for us. And I think we should have more choices and uh, it's um, no consumer's choice to, to support certain kind of foods like uh, if they like plant-based that they can, they can buy more plant-based food. And, um, and uh, real uh, animal meat, I think, might still be here for a long while, um, but um, certainly will reduce um, the consumption. Uh, and, uh, and, and I don't think uh, we, should, we should aim to completely replace uh, animal meat, <laughs> uh, which is not the mission of, uh, of us. Um, we, our mission is to save the planet. Yeah. Yoav, uh, would you like to uh, uh, respond next? Yeah, I, I agree. It's not going to be a complete 
placement, but uh, definitely most of the meat or the animal-based food has to be replaced and it will happen because we have no other way uh, to save the planet or that would be probably the most important way to save the planet. But I'd like to mention that in addition to uh, alternatives for meat, milk and eggs, we will also see uh, in, the near, in the near future uh, several other in important innovation in the food, for example, technologies for reducing food waste by upcycling low-grade food, raw materials, and also in developments and innovation and personalized nutrition based on the human genome and the human microbiome. And we will also see more and more artificial intelligence and big database technologies to boost the food industry from farm to fork and enhancing the human health by enabling smarter food choices and improving the consumer trust in the food industry. Menachem. Yeah, well, I'm a plant guy. So for me, <laughs> I will always prefer to see proteins coming out of plants. I don't mind eating my steak, making totally out of chickpea and soy proteins, as long as it's tasty. <laughs> anyway, it's going to save tons of water. Doesn't matter how you grow your meat, is it in fermenters or cow, it's going to consume either a lot of electricity or a lot of methane release. Look at the energy source however you want. So I say, let's, of course, we cannot not eat meat, but I would say if you can develop a good alternatives, really, I don't mind eating good steak made totally out of proteins that come directly from the plant. Um, the rest for me is the price for the rest is so expensive that I, I would try to reduce the expenses as much as possible. But this is me. And uh, Esha, uh, please. And then uh, I have another uh, couple of questions here from the audience. Mm, I, I tend to agree with Eric. I, I don't eat meat and I think that eating meat in general is something that should go away from this planet. But in our lifetime, all of us, meat will, will remain. Uh, we are hoping, and this is our belief, that the high quality meat, that is, it tends to be usually better for the planet and also better for the animal uh, and better for people, will remain. Uh, but what is known as factory farming should be dramatically reduced. It's not going to be 100%. Uh, unfortunately, it's too much embedded in, in cultures and politics all over the world. But, but there is a chance, I believe, that, that the vision of eliminating meat is, is really, really far, hundreds of years. But in the next 10 years, to reduce factory farming by 50%, dramatic, it will change countries, it will change uh, and the planet, it will change supply chain, is possible because there is no industry like that, that that is as big, as important, but as damaging to the planet and just growing, growing every year. And if we don't reverse that, it will be very challenging to do it in, in the following decade. So we, we have to believe it's possible. It, we have to believe it's dramatic. But still people, including in my family, will eat a good steak once a year, but it will be an extremely good steak. Well, with that, um, thank you very much uh, to, uh, to each of the panelists. Um, uh, I think the convergence of ESG, social and impact investing, what we've seen uh, in the food and agri-tech uh, space is clearly uh, something for all of us to, to be well aware of. And so I just want to thank each of you. Uh, in closing, I now will invite um, King Ao to, to, to return and invite uh, the consul uh, in, in uh, Hong Kong uh, for Israel, uh, Amir Lati. Over to you, uh, uh, King. Um, I, so thank you again. Uh, I'm not sure whether I was muted or not, but I want to thank Peter as well as our expert speakers again for their most insightful sharing. I also want to thank our audience for their great questions. For those questions that we have not been able to uh, answer uh, right now, uh, we'll follow up uh, with you directly after the, the forum. Uh, but please also stay behind uh, for a couple of minutes to fill in a short feedback survey which will help us you know, organize our event uh, better going forward. 
I'm now very honored to introduce Mr. Amir Letty, Consul General of the State of Israel in Hong Kong SAR and Macau SAR as our guest of honor to give the closing remark. Although Mr. Letty only took up his new role in Hong Kong last September, he has already become a key opinion leader in time appearing on newspapers, TV shows, and social media regularly. Mr. Letty is an old China hen, having studied Chinese at Beijing University under a Chinese government scholarship and stationed as Deputy Consul General of Israel in Shanghai from 2006 to 2010, as well as the Consul General in Chengdu from 2014 to 2018. In fact, Mr. Letty also speaks Korean and knows Asia well, being a director of North East Asia Department of the Asia and Pacific Division of Israel's <laughs> Ministry of Foreign Affairs before coming to Hong Kong. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Letty. Thank you uh, very much, King. Uh, in fact, after everything that you just said, I feel it would be better for me just to retire now uh, at the peak uh, and not say anything, but I would like to say a few uh, comments. First of all, um, as we end today's event, uh, which I think, and also judging from the amount of participants in QN was a very interesting one, I would like to thank everyone that was joining this uh, event, this workshop. Uh, this is, in fact, the first event uh, that is part of the Hong Kong-Israel Collaboration Workshop Series, uh, partnering with FSDC, Invest Hong Kong, and the Consulate General of Israel in Hong Kong. So again, I want to avail this opportunity and uh, express my sincere gratitude to the panelists and speakers for sharing their expertise and knowledge with us. Uh, I would like to say a few words about the food tech um, generally and of course specifically in Israel. My apologies being the last to speak, I'll probably repeat some of the things that uh, were said uh, before. Uh, so my uh, apologies for that. Uh, but I have to emphasize that we have chosen this fast growing field of food tech, which combines in my eyes and not only in my eyes, more than environmental values, as well as innovative technology, and at the same time has inve high investment potential, because we do believe that among its, uh, it's one of the most fast developing and growing fields, it has potential to continue to develop in Israel and abroad. And as you uh, saw before, the investment in Israel startup industry in the field, for example, of alternative pro protein jumped by 450 million in 2021, and amounted in $623 million US. Uh, we do think also that the collaboration in this field with Hong Kong can give an extra value here uh, in this field because there are many aspects that answers the needs of Hong Kong as a place with uh, limited agricultural resources, for example, of course, the natural things to say land. And at the same time, again, uh, bearing the environmental and moral values that I just mentioned. The constantly growing world population results in increasing demand for food. Hence, food science and technology have tremendous scope for growth. It has made progress in the meeting and the growing demand for food around the world. And advancement in this field will, le will lead to improved quality of food, safe consumption, variety of food items, affordable cost of food uh, items, better preservation techniques, etc. Currently, the food sector contributes over 20% of total greenhouse uh, gas emissions. And the challenge facing the world regarding food production now is how to develop food systems that are not reliant on food, uh, fossil food and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In this way, it is possible to use food tech to ensure food security, to provide food to a growing population uh, on the world, and so on and so forth. Uh, in the food industry, technological change is taking place in parallel in seven dimensions, the most prominent of which is the need to reduce the use of animals as a source of protein. We have discussed it uh, lengthily during today. Uh, we see it as an important moral value. And there are companies that focus, as you heard, on developing products from plant sources, as well as uh, multiplying living cells. 
In 2021, Israel maintained its position as a global powerhouse in cultivated meat, second only to the United States, as we saw in investment in, in the number of alternative protein startups. Over the 36% of investment in this field was in Israeli startups, 11 new companies established in 2021, and currently there are more than 100 companies that are active in the development of food industry and technology in Israel. And as we heard, seven incubators and accelerators, both private and governmental. I would like to stress and say uh, a few words about uh, the government support in the food tech in Israel. The Israeli Innovation Authority provides increasing support for alternate proteins over the last decades. Uh, and the Innovation Authority of Israel has provided approximately $33 million in funding to alternate protein ventures, close to 80%, which have uh, pro uh, pro uh, provided in the last three years. And in 2021, the total support for alternative protein was approximately 13 million US, which amounted to 60% of the funding of the Innovation Authority for all food tech ventures and has researched geopolitical changes as well as food security. Another good example that uh, I think we used their data before, Peter, and I, I do want to thank them and mention them is the Good Food uh, Institute, GFI, which is an international nonprofit reimagining uh, meat production. Their goal is to make the global food system better for the planet, people, and animals. GFI are developing the roadmap for sustainable, secure, and protein supply, and they um, identify the most effective solution, mobilize resource and talent in order to make it, the proteins more accessible, affordable, and delicious. Before I will conclude, I will just mention again that the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as other geopolitical changes that we are uh, experiencing in these very moments, have emphasized the need to have greater food resilience and food security, because we have seen how food supply chain have been disrupted by both natural causes, as well as other geopolitical changes and export restrictions that have been imposed by some countries. Before I will conclude, I would just I want to say that the way I see the directive of this consulate here in Hong Kong, uh, King mentioned it uh, briefly, I think, is really to bring Hong Kong and Israel closer, especially in the field of investments, in the field of um, trade, and in the field of te technology. We really see ourselves as um, at your disposal uh, for any contacts that uh, might be required, might be required uh, with Israeli companies. We will, with your permission, write uh, now in the chat box email, uh, contact email of the consulate, and you're more than welcome to contact us with any suggestion, requirement, and so on. Thank you very much. <laughs> With the audience, please stay behind to uh, fill in the uh, polling question. It will only take you a minute or two. Thank you. Thank you again for joining us today.